Homeowner's insurance is a scam. And in this two-part video series, we're gonna be talking about the fraud that the insurance companies are perpetuating on the victims, the policyholders, and we're gonna be also talking about the parties involved, such as the contractors, public adjusters, and attorneys. Before we can continue though, we all need to agree on the definition we're using for a scam. I like the one right out of Merriam-Webster, which is a fraudulent or deceptive act or operation. We're also gonna be talking about in this video series how the insurance industry as a whole has used the government and colluded with them in a corruptive way to perpetuate its scam on the people and using the, the government basically as an enforcement arm and a get out of jail free card. And we're gonna be talking about that more in part two. Before we go on, I want you to write down in the comments sections though, any experiences you have had with your homeowner's insurance policy, good or bad. I know there's a lot of people that have had good, good experiences out there with them, but go ahead and put in the comments what your feelings are and what your reaction and experiences have been. And I would love to read those myself. Now, for as long as I can remember, insurance companies have controlled the narrative. It has been a one-sided conversation where they are coming into the state of Florida, they are providing us with a, 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 a golden parachute, if you will, this wonderful service that we all need and benefit from, and that they are these poor, sad victims of contractor fraud and public adjusters and attorneys taking advantage of the insurance companies. If you Google or research this issue at all, you are just going to find article after article after article, news, news special after news special after news special about how the, the poor insurance companies are being victimized by these bad players and bad characters and that they are being defrauded by contractors and public adjusters uh, left and right. Now, this does occur on some scale. Okay, there is these moments where a, a public adjuster or maybe a contractor like a roofer will lie about the damage that you have, file it with the insurance company and try to defraud the insurance company in order to get a job out of it. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. What I'm arguing is that it does not happen on the scale that the insurance companies want you to believe that it happens on. Now, what you won't find in this, uh, in this narrative, if you will, in this research, is you won't find how the insurance companies are essentially defrauding their customers. And the way they do this is that they essentially underpay, they deny claims, and they just don't give you enough money to cover the actual damages caused by the event. The biggest event here in Florida is obviously going to be hurricanes. Uh, hurricanes and tropical storms. And this is the big problem. And then what happens is when the insurance company doesn't cover the loss fully, and then you have to get a public adjuster or an attorney and you file suit against the insurance company, and the insurance company ultimately ends up paying because they lose either in court or in pre-court proceedings, um, then they go ahead and tally all those dollars up as fraud as well. Ah, that we were, we were defrauded. Okay, so the fraud numbers can't even really be trusted that they're putting out there of whether they're being defrauded or not when they deny so many claims, so many billions of dollars of claims they just deny. In Hurricane Ian, over 25% of every single hurricane uh, policy, homeowner's policy claim that had been filed was closed with zero payouts. Now you're telling me one in four people in Florida were mistaken about the hurricane damage that they, that they sustained on their property? It's completely ridiculous. What really bothers me is how they have essentially controlled this story, they have controlled um, uh, this, and they have mislabeled in a lot of cases the fraud that they're actually experiencing. And nobody talks about the fraud they're committing. As an example of some of this narrative that's been out there, I found a, a news report um, out of Tampa Bay uh, called The Price of Paradise, and it's a whole explanation on why your insurance rates are going up so much. So let's watch this together and I'll react uh, as it goes along. 
property insurance companies in the state of Florida are going bankrupt one after another. So most people with homes under $650,000 have what's called the last resort state subsidized property insurance citizens. But take a look at Hudson resident Elizabeth Roach's bill. Back in 2019, her premium was $769 a year. It went up to $1,500 last year and this year more than $1,900. That is almost three times as it was two years ago and it really just makes you wonder okay what is going on here that is the thousand dollar question yeah it's it's more than the thousand dollar question it's the multi-billion dollar question rates have gone up three times threefold for a lot of people in two years and this this news report is going to go on and explain how the reason for this is fraud is that contractors out of state or whatever and homeowners and and public adjusters are defrauding these poor poor insurance companies and it's this it's this narrative to say well that's why we have to triple your rates are you kidding me wait till you see the numbers further on in this According to insurance.com, the average home insurance cost in Florida for a $300,000 home is $3,600, which is about $1,300 more than the national average. Do you think maybe insurance in Florida is higher than the national average, though, because Florida experiences hurricanes on almost like a bi yearly basis in tropical storms? You know, we have a lot more building damaging weather events than pretty much anywhere else in the country. So it sort of makes sense that insurance is going to be a little bit more expensive here in Florida. I went to veteran insurance agent Kathy Walsh for answers. The reason is, is due to all of the fraud that we've seen going on in Florida. There is an organized undercurrent of roofers, public adjusters, attorneys canvassing neighborhoods about the roof on your house. Even though it's a 24 year old roof and it's only good for 20 years, we can get you a new roof put on by your insurance carrier. Okay, there's two problems with this. One, she claims it's organized, as if this is some sort of organized crime that's going around out there and there are mafia bosses that are all only interested in defrauding insurance companies. Nine times out of 10, when I see this stuff, and I get, I get involved sometimes as an expert witness for the homeowner. I, I, I don't make money off of any insurance proceeds. I do very little insurance work. But in those moments where I do get involved in those cases and I see these contractors, the contractors are pointing out legitimate hurricane damage that the homeowner isn't aware of because they're not an expert. They're not a roofer and they stand on the road and they look at their house and they look at their roof and they're like, I don't know, it looks okay to me. Right, And then months go by and then and a roofer shows up and he's like, hey, do you mind if I walk your roof and check it out? And he walks the roof and he's like, this roof is shot. Like it, you know, it's, it's, you've got, you've got folded over uh, shingles, you've got granular loss, you've got all these problems that you don't know because you're the homeowner and you can't see from the ground. Okay. And so the question is, is, is that roofer of the bad guy um, or are they actually helping out that homeowner? The second problem I have about her narrative is that she talks about, well, you know, you have a 24 year old roof uh, and it's only good for 20 years and you expect to get a new roof from this storm damage or whatever. Um, my question is, is, well, then why did the insurance company insure the property? Because you see, no policy out there has an old roof discount because they're only going to not pay you for your roof because of how old it is. OK, you're paying for replacement cost. That is what you're paying for. That's what the contract's for. If you had a total loss, for example, of your entire house, the value that's in your insurance policy is for the value to rebuild the house, okay? So, so why, if, if only a component is destroyed, like the roof, why wouldn't it, the value be to replace it with a new roof? Okay, that's what you're paying for in your very expensive insurance premium. You are not paying to have an old roof put on because your old roof got damaged. It's, it's total nonsense. Walsh says these companies get the homeowner to sign an assignment of benefits, allowing the roofer to deal directly with the insurance company, often claiming storm damage and ending up in court. Florida makes up 10% of all insurance claims nationwide, but we are 76% of lawsuits nationwide. According to Guy Carpenter Industry Reporting, property insurers had $1.22 in underwriting losses from January to September of 2021. Why do you think Florida has so many lawsuits? The, the, the implication is that somehow um, contractors and public adjusters in Florida are fleecing the insurance industry, okay? 
But why aren't there all these false claims about hail damage and everything else all around the nation? Or could it be that 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 insur the insurers, the insurance companies, um, have made a huge mistake? Because what they've done is they have sold insurance policies throughout the nation, some of them throughout the world, but let's just focus on, 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 on America and the nation. And Florida gets hit a lot. There's a lot of expenses there. They don't like that. Florida is an expensive place to pay out. They don't have to pay out to South Dakota and, 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 and they don't have to pay out to Virginia as much. They don't have to pay out to California as much. They don't have to pay out to Texas as much. Florida gets hit a lot. So those policies have to pay out a lot. All right. So when when you're an insurer and you're looking at the whole nation, you're looking at Florida and you're saying, "Ooh, that's a hot spot. That's really expensive. So is it the reason why we have more uh, lawsuits in Florida because Florida is just such an evil litigious state? Or is it because the insurance industry as a whole has decided to deny more claims in Florida? without just without justification because it's so expensive and they're trying to watch their bottom line and therefore the only then response that people have in florida is to sue the insurance companies so this brings us to the question are the insurance companies even really being defrauded on a huge scale in the video that we just watched they talked about 1.22 billion now they're talking like industry-wide they're claiming 1.22 billion dollars in fraud of course, without context, that just sounds like a really huge number. But the reality is, is that like literally like State Farm just by itself spends something like seven billion dollars just in advertising every year. One point two two billion dollars in fraud is not why your policy tripled. OK, in two years, that is that doesn't explain that. And so the question is, is is it is it really truly probably pro properly being categorized as fraud uh, that 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 we're all defrauding the insurance companies or is it that they just don't want to meet their contractual obligation they get sued and then they claim that those suits are fraud you got to remember that the insurance companies are insuring your property in an as is condition in other words they're not insuring it if you get a new roof or if you replace the windows, they're insuring that building at that address at that time that the policy gets put in place. So then to turn around and say, well, the reason why you suffered so much damage is because your roof is so old or because your windows are so old is, is a very lame excuse. You knew they were old or you should have known you, they were old or you could have sent somebody out to investigate these things. And if you didn't like how old the roof was or how old the windows were, you could have not insured the property which is clearly you're right, you're a private business, you can you don't have to sign contracts with people that you don't want to. Um, or you could have required that in order for you to write a policy that they must replace the roof or they must replace the windows or they must make these corrections to the structure or building in order for you to write a policy for them. Now they don't really ever do this unless the building's huge and the policy's massive, they don't want to know what the problems and issues are with your building because then they lose what's called plausible deniability. The insurance company wants to be in the dark, right? They don't want to know how old your roof is and, and all these things because when you go and file a claim, then they can use that and say, oh, well, you never told us it was so old. So therefore, that's why we're not going to pay for a whole new roof. The, 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 uh, the other thing, too, is you have to ask yourself, then why do they do this? Why do they write the policies? Why don't they inspect these buildings? Why don't they say, um, tell the policyholders, you must replace the roof because it's too old and we don't want to insure that? Uh, or you need to replace whatever component, windows, whatever. You know, why don't they do that? Well, it's pretty obvious. It comes down to an issue of greed. The insurance companies want money. They want your premiums. OK, their pre your premiums account for billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars of profit for them every year. Profit, by the way, that they that they don't necessarily have to um, uh, store away for the next year, which will, you know, that's sort of a whole other video series in itself that I, I wish I could do more on. But um, ultimately, it kind of works like this. The losses from a single year are need to balance out with their profits from that year. And if it doesn't, then they just throw their hands up in the air. They say, hey, we're gonna go insolvent. And then the state of Florida has to step in and back them up. And the question is, well, what about last year when there was no hurricane? 
or the year before when you posted $10 billion of profits or the year before that when you posted $11 billion in profits. Like, where is all this money sitting, you know? Well, they pay it out to the shareholders and they get rid of it, right? Um, and so they only ever have to balance their sheet on the year of the loss, which is completely insane. And so all of this is essentially a pretense for the insurance companies playing the victim card, okay? Um, they have thoroughly convinced the Republican Party and many Democrats in Florida that they are being victimized, that they um, are going broke, that they are being defrauded on this colossal scale by, by public adjusters and contractors and, and attorneys. And they have convinced the Florida government that they need more protections, okay, from, from the villains out there, their policyholders and the people we hire, I guess. The, the, particularly what they want is they want more protection from lawsuits and they want protection from codes and ordinances clauses. So code, codes and ordinance clause is in most uh, uh, insurance uh, agreements. And basically what it means is this, is that if there's a code out there that says that um, you can't repair just 50% of a roof, you must replace the whole thing, then the insurance company is required to pay for the whole thing because the code requires it. So that's sort of generally how code and ordinances coverage works. They want to try to get away from that and not have that be um, a part of what they're held to anymore. So there are three primary ways I have, I have, I have uh, researched and found that these insurance companies are, are, are using to, to scam the, the, uh, the policyholders, right, the, 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 the public. One is they deflect. So in other words, you file, a, you have a storm come by or water damage, whatever, right? You have some sort of incident that happens at your, your property, you file a claim with your insurance company and they deflect. So what they mean, that means is that they blame it on something else. We kind of talked about that a little bit with age. They blame it on the age of the roof or the age of the windows. They will also blame it on a lack of maintenance. And they'll say, well, the only reason your windows leaked isn't because a hurricane shook them and rattled them and broke the very brittle caulking around there, okay, which is a covered, which is covered under insurance policies and under the law. Um, and they, they don't want to say that. They want to say, well, you failed to maintain the sealant around the windows and therefore it's your fault and not the hurricane's fault or whatever and we're not paying. So it's a, it's a way to deflect um, the, the blame and the responsibility that they have to pay to uh, uh, policyholders. And then of course they love their favorite one which is the um, exclusion clause for wind-driven rain. Wind-driven rain is such a nebulous term. It's such a gray area. What does it actually mean? Well, there is actual definitions for it. The insurance company knows what the definition of wind-driven rain is. Wind-driven rain is water that is driven into inside of the building by wind where no visible or obvious damage was occurred to the building. So an example of this might be um, a window with, a, with an operable sash that goes up and down. Okay, 90, 999 out of a thousand storms, water just runs down the window, window never leaks. But when you get rain coming at 150 miles an hour horizontal hitting that glass and the water is pushed up over the sash and into the room, okay, but the window wasn't damaged. It just entered through a normal passageway, all right? That's wind-driven rain, okay? But but they, they will use that, and I'll show you some examples. They will use that as an excuse to not pay all sorts of blatant, obvious hurricane damages, chunks of roofs that are missing, and so on, that where water came in and they say, ah, but that's wind-driven rain. And it's really not, and they know they're lying. What they're hoping is that you can't afford an attorney to go and chase them down and, and get them to prove them wrong. The other thing they'll do, so the first thing they do is to deflect blame. The second thing that they will do is just simply deny. And I'm not saying like that they'll deny your claim because of some clause or some sort of reading. They'll deny that your building's actually even damaged. They will, um, they will uh, take a, a, a public adjuster, or not public adjusters, I'm sorry, the independent adjusters that work for the insurance companies, and the ins that, in, uh, that uh, um, adjuster will say, um, you need a new roof, it got severely damaged in the hurricane. And then the desk adjuster will look at it and be like, no, it's not damaged. I've li I looked at his photos, it's not damaged, so we're not giving you anything for the roof. So it's just completely like a denying of the obvious. They're, they're not even trying to find some sort of clause or loophole under which to deny you. They're literally just denying reality, right? They're denying that that photo even shows damage. They just, they act like, no, that, that's not true at all. 
And the third way that uh, these insurance companies are scamming uh, the policyholders is that they will make an argument of repair versus replace. And where this comes down is there's a lot of times, uh, and roofing is like the number one place where this happens, okay? So roofing is like the, the first off, roofing is one of the biggest insurance expenses by far in Florida. Um, and then secondly, it's uh, it's one of the ones where the insurance companies are now beginning to really push this narrative that all of these roofs are repairable, okay? They're all, oh, this is always repairable. The thing is, is, is the insurance company agreed to insure, let's say a 15 or 20 year old shingle roof. That shingle at 15, 20, year old, 20 years old is very brittle, like very, very brittle. And so a hurricane comes by and damages, let's say 25% of the roof. And the roofer goes out there and he's like, he starts trying to pry it up and saying, I can't, um, I can't repair 25% of the roof because everywhere where I put my tool, the, the shingles are so brittle that they just fall apart and they rip and they break apart. So how are you supposed to marry the repaired area in with the pre-existing area, you, you can't do it because every time you try to tie those in, you're damaging the existing area more and more and more. So it's an unrepairable roof. And the insurance companies are making this argument, oh no, no, this is definitely repairable. There's been a viral video on the internet about a state farm adjuster arguing with a roofer. And I wanna watch this, uh, at least a, a, a tidbit of it with you here, uh, cause I find this really fascinating. Tell me, the, you say you're agreeing this roof's repairable. Have you did a BT on it? What's a BT? You don't know what a BT is? No. A brittle test? We don't do brittle tests. Is that what you did right here and damage this shingle? No. I'm not here to look at the pliability of the shingle. Okay. Is this the correct way to remove a shingle? No, I'm asking you. I don't know. That's what I'm saying. The nail's right I'm here. A, I'm not a roofer. I'm here to but look at the pliability of the But you can tell me how I'm doing it wrong. I'm a roofer. So I'm going to do it. If you don't know how to do it, how can you make a coverage decision? I'm here to look at the pliability of the shingle. All right. How does that now? Okay. All right. We're, we're past that. So you agree the nail's up right now, right? Yes. Now, how do I want to get this nail out? Can you, I mean, I'm just asking you. I'm not being a smart ass. I'm just being dead ass serious. I'm just trying to show that. So how would you get this nail out? I'm here. Not. I'm not here to tell you how to do your job. Okay. I'm so, just here to look at the pliability of the. Is shingles. that the right way? I'm here. Yes. How do you find this nail? Is that the correct way? That correct way? Can I, can I lift it up? Because here's the nail. Right? Mm -hmm. It rips. Oh, it rips. So, yeah. yeah if you, I mean, if you're going aggressive like that, it will. Aggressive? Yeah. Sir, are you. What do you mean? What do you mean? You have you get the nail out. How are you talking? What do you mean? That's how you have to get the nail out. No, I'm just saying I'm not there has to be shingle. a willingness there to actually complete the repair, and I don't see that. Are you serious? Yes, sir. <laughs> so he says there has to be a willingness there to try and repair it and I don't see it. Now the contractor clearly knows a lot more than this guy does. This video goes on, they start talking about roof snakes, the tools and, and the tools of the trade and how to actually do it. And this guy, this adjuster repeats over and over again that he is um, not a roofer. I'm not a roofer, I'm not a roofer. Not only is he not a roofer, he's never been a roofer. He doesn't know anything about roofing, okay? And he says multiple times that he's, his own, the only reason he's there at the site today, at this particular time, because this is not like the first adjustment they're doing, right? This is like further in the process where they're arguing and debating with the insurance company because clearly the insurance company only wants to pay for repairs to this roof. And this roofer is saying, you can't repair this roof. You have to replace the whole thing. And so state, they sent, State Farm sends out a guy and the guy who has nothing, knows nothing about roofing is supposed to be their expert. And he says, oh no, it's repair. One, he's saying two things. He's saying one, it's repairable. And two, you're not trying hard enough to repair it. You're, you're, you're not showing a, you know, a, a desire to repair this roof in good faith. Um, and it's really truly like an insult to the roofer. You know, it would be one thing if the roofer had just called them and said, um, it's unrepairable. But the roofer is on the roof with the gentleman explaining to him and showing him and asking him pointed questions. And the guy has no answer for him. You see, the, 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 the uh, uh, person from State Farm already had a predetermined notion in his head that this roof was repairable. And he, it doesn't matter what evidence you show this person, that's the narrative they're going to stick to and they're not gonna veer from that at all. So before I close this video, I wanna go over some real world examples. Um, one, uh, I don't have photos to show you, but it's a contractor here in town. Now I have 
dozens and dozens of these stories, but some of these are more obvious and blatant and interesting. And uh, the second one, I have a lot of photos and video I'll show you. Uh, the first one is a contractor here in town who has an office building, like, you know, like, like any other little office building with a flat roof, and he's got AC units on top of the building. Uh, Hurricane Ian came by, ripped the AC units off of the roof, ripped holes into the roofing, the rain just poured straight through the holes into the office and completely destroyed, you know, most of his office furniture, computers, electronics, printers, all that stuff, right? Drywall. I mean, just tons of damage because you had uh, record rainfalls falling through two giant holes on his roof. The insurance company came back and basically denied his entire claim stating that it was wind driven rain. And this goes back to what I said previously in the video. This is a real world example. This isn't just me like making up things. This is a real world example of the insurance company knowing for a fact that this does not meet the definition of wind driven rain, but they know that the burden then goes on. Once they say we're not covering it because it's, it's wind driven rain, the burden goes on to the property owner to have to come up with all of these funds to hire an attorney, to hire experts, to prove the insurance company wrong. And the insurance company knows that in the vast majority of claims where it denies them fraudulently, it denies them that, that they will suffer no repercussions because people can't afford to go after the insurance company. In my second example, uh, I went down to a condominium um, on one of the islands here and they had three buildings, okay? The one of the buildings was completely just gone. I mean, it's just completely destroyed, not even on site. I think all, all I remember seeing was the um, foundation post sticking up. It was a three-story building, just gone. The other two buildings have this distinct lean to them. They're leaning away from the direction of the wind and the storm surge, and they have significant damage. Building two has most of its upper floor ripped open. You can see the bathroom, you can see the, the floor space in there. On the ground floor, the floor had completely collapsed out. Um, this building was severely, severely damaged. The uh, building three had similar damages. It doesn't look as bad from the exterior, but very similar damages um, to that building. It's also leaning, so the superstructure is completely shot. Um, uh, structural components on underneath the ground floor, were, or on the ground floor, I mean, were severely broken and, and apart and stuff and so the insurance company the insurance adjuster to his credit from the insurance company says um this is a little beyond my expertise we're going to get engineers out here so the insurance company sends an engineer out there the engineer tells the client my client that these buildings were completely and you know virtually completely destroyed by the hurricane it doesn't matter that they're still kind of look like they're standing up they're completely structurally unsound they're unsafe and they're not repairable okay this is what the engineer says for the insurance company so the, my client is thinking, well, this is great. Um, and and the, actually the engineer in his report recommends that the building be, buildings be raised. In other words, completely destroyed in order to eliminate this, this safety hazard. And the insurance company comes back and the desk adjuster decides that he's smarter than the, than the field adjuster and that he's smarter than the engineer, the licensed professional engineering team that went out there and looked at the property. And he decides that the buildings are repairable. And he starts talking out of his rear about how you can lift the building up and fix the foundation and the structure and all this nonsense and just completely flabbergasting my client. So before the buildings got raised, they asked me, they hired me to go out there and look at these buildings and to try to determine some of the causality of damages, extent of damages, and of course, um, opine on repairability of these structures. Um, subsequent to my site visit, I had the, the, you have to understand that the homeowners themselves also have policies. Okay. And so what we're having now on this case is we have cases like this where the flood policy is saying, no, all of the damage was caused by wind. We don't want to pay out anything. And the wind insurance policy is saying, um, no, all of the damage was uh, caused by uh, the flood, so we don't want to pay out anything, right? Um, and then you have the, um, and then you have the the uh, 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 individual homeowners policies, which are saying, oh, it's wind-driven rain, or it's this, or it's that, and it's not covered under our policy. So you have all of these different policies and all of these different insurance companies essentially pointing the finger at each other, so that they can all sort of create a, 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 a temporary situation where they kick the can down the road, they don't have to pay out anything. And this leaves uh, folks like my clients in a, in a pickle where they now have to retain um, uh, professionals like engineers like myself, and they have to retain a, an attorney, and they have to probably sue the insurance companies 
which now becomes an even bigger burden because you're not just pursuing one company, you're pursuing multiple different ones in order to get what they are owed. In part two uh, of this video series, we're going to dive deeper into the actual laws that have been passed really recently in Florida. Laws that support and perpetuate this, this fraudulent and scam-like activity from, uh, from uh, Florida state insurers, but insurers in general. And we're gonna be talking about um, not only state corruption, but we're also going to be looking at industry whistleblowers in some of the interviews that they've been giving. And we're gonna talk about how this is all coming to the surface now and hopefully channels like this and other people out there um, can start raising awareness of this problem because like I said uh, at the very beginning of this video, this is an issue and a narrative that has been controlled by the insurance companies forever. Hopefully we can change that.